And what we're going to talk about initially really are three things. So firstly, what is HPC? Why we use it. Secondly, to give you a general idea of the themes that we're going to cover over these two days and why we're going to cover them. And then thirdly, give you an overview of Archer and an introduction to how we actually interact with the system before you guys then crack on and have a play with this yourself in the first practical. So firstly then, what is HPC and what's it used for? Well, I don't know if you've heard this said, but a lot of people refer to simulation as a third methodology. So in modern science, we've got theory, we've got experimentation, but we've also got simulation. And this can be really useful, this can be really helpful, where experimentation is either very difficult to do or impossible to do. And simulation can be really, really important to help people test and prove their theories. And also it can help focus and direct experiments as well. So a lot of people find simulation to be a critical tool in their day-to-day -day activities. But people often continually, when they're simulating their systems, they want to simulate these things more accurately, do it faster, and do bigger systems. And the problem that we face is single processor technology, what we call serial processors, just can't keep up with the demand that we're placing on them for scientific computing. And they haven't been able to for years. So instead what we've got to do is we have to take a problem, split it up into a number of parts, and solve these parts concurrently. And at the end, bring all these intermediate answers together to get the final answer, which is our solution. Now, as you'll see, when we're doing parallelism, it introduces a number of new considerations, a number of new things that we've got to address and think about, but we don't have any option, because in order to support modern scientific simulation, this is a route we're forced down. So as I say, we don't do parallelism out of choice. It's the critical enabler for us to do modern simulation. So that's why we do simulation and where parallelism comes into this. Now, before we start talking about a specialist HPC machine like Archer in, um, in any detail, I think it's worth thinking about something really general, really generic, which um, will relate to something you already know. So imagine in this room, the vast majority of us, if not all of us, have got laptops. So if we connected all the laptops together directly through a network, we could then take a problem, split it up into lots of different parts, and do a little bit of each one of these parts on the individual laptops. And then, at the end, bring all the answers together for this final solution, final answer. So it might look something like this. These laptops connected by network. And in our HPC terminology, we would call these, each of these laptops, compute nodes. Because they're doing computation. And what the word node means is actually it's fairly independent from any other node. In terms of these nodes, your laptops run their own operating system, have their own connection to the network, etc., etc. And really what would be key here is for this network connection to be as fast as possible. Because we'll see later on, often when we're solving things in parallel, we need to send messages around to help with this, to support this, and we want this communication to happen as quickly as possible. Now the last thing to say on this is often nowadays laptops aren't single core but they're what's called multi-core and we're going to talk about this in much more detail later on in the course but your processor, the package, actually contains a number of processor cores. So that's what dual core means, it's got two processor cores. Or quad core, it's got four processor cores. So these nodes, these compute nodes, tend to have a number of processor cores within them. So if these were quad-core laptops, overall, we'd have 20 processor cores that we could execute over. And we're going to talk about all this in much more detail uh, later on in the course. So that's a general overview, that's a general generic idea of what a very general parallel machine might look like. Obviously, Archer, the UK national supercomputer, is not a whole load of laptops connected together. It's actually much more specialist than that, but this just gives you the general idea. Now, what I wanted to do now was illustrate a number of different examples 
of the use people make of Archer, the use people make of simulation here in the UK. And the first one on the top left of the screen is a dinosaur. And this is by a team at Manchester University, and they use Archer and the previous machine, the previous national supercomputer, to simulate dinosaurs, working with paleontologists. And they really accurately laser scan in the fossils, but they've not got any idea initially how the joints would have been configured, what the muscles would have looked like, the ligaments, etc., etc. So in parallel, they do a whole load of different permutations to figure out what would have run and what would have fallen over. And at the end of it, they get something like this, where these red things that you can probably see are the ligaments or the muscles themselves. Now, this is a prime example of where they can't do experimentation because dinosaurs have been dead, I don't know, 65 million years. So instead, to test and further develop the theories, they have to rely on simulation. And actually, this has changed quite a lot of knowledge about dinosaurs. These are Edmontosauruses, about how these would have moved, about how T-Rexes would have moved. They've had papers in Nature, papers on the BBC News website, articles, sorry, etc., etc. So that's dinosaurs. The next thing, then, is bone modelling. And this is on the top right of the screen. And this is a university, the University of Hull, who use Archer to model bones. And Neil Ofer, who's going to be helping out in this course, giving a number of the talks and helping with the practicals, she works with these guys in quite a lot of detail. And what they use Archer for is not only looking at the bones themselves, but also putting forces on the bones to see how the bones then bend, how cracks might propagate, and how bones might snap. They also look at different materials and how these interact with the bones. So if you want to replace a joint in the body, what's the best material to use? So again, that's a, a popular use of, of Archer by these guys. And at the bottom, we've got the Community Earth System model, which is one of the weather models, one of the climate models that runs on Archer. We've got a whole load of weather models, including the Unified model, which is very popular in this country, and a whole load of meteorologists and weather and climate researchers that use the machine. Now, the reason I've picked these three examples, probably this one at the bottom, the last one I talked about, that's probably no great surprise that we use supercomputers to simulate the weather, simulate climate. But I can imagine at the start of the day, you had no idea whatsoever, you wouldn't have even guessed that dinosaurs had been simulated on Archer. And also, you probably had no idea wouldn't have guessed that bones are simulated on Archer. And it really is amazing how simulation forms the critical part of so many fields that you wouldn't necessarily associate it with. And that's one of the really interesting things for us guys teaching the course, speaking to you, finding out about your research area, and often the novel ways that you want to use this resource. So this is just three examples. Um, and what I've done is I looked at Archer, I looked at the statistics for the past month, and these are all on the Archer website, and made a couple of graphs based upon this. And the first graph is on the right, and this is usage of the machine by different research areas. And what you can see is that the most common use of Archer is in material science currently, for the past month. Um, areas of biomolecular science, climate, weather, ocean modelling, computational fluid dynamics, again, they're very popular areas as well. And then a whole load of other areas that um, also contribute. What I've also done, based upon these statistics, is to look at the different programming languages people use to program this machine. And what you can see, by far the most common programming language people use on a machine like Archer is Fortran. We've got C and C++, smaller percentages, and then a very small bit of Python. Now, if you've done programming, you've done some technical work in other fields, this choice of languages, or specifically what's been missed off this list, might surprise you. Because some really popular technologies, some really popular languages in other fields, aren't used on these machines. And the specific reasons why, and the reason people use these languages, is because they give them the performance they give them the support they need. And we're going to talk about this in more detail later on in the course. But this is the reason for the practicals that we're going to be doing. We have Fortran versions, we have C versions, and we've got some Python versions as well. Again, because people are using these languages to program the machines for good reason. So what we're going to come on to now then is just to give you a little bit of an idea of some of the topics we're going to cover 
and why we're going to cover them. So the first topic we're going to cover is that of parallel computing. And we're going to talk about how you might have a problem, such as one of your problems, and then conceptually how to split that, different ways of splitting that into lots of different parts that can be solved concurrently. We're going to talk about some of the pros and cons of doing this, some of the technologies that we've got to support us writing parallel codes, and also metrics to be able to determine whether we've done a good job of parallelism or whether we still need to do more work to properly take advantage of a resource like Archer. So there'll be lots and lots of content on parallel computing. Another thing we're going to talk about is the hardware itself. And firstly, knowing what hardware you have available in a machine like Archer gives you a good idea of what you can take advantage of for your problems. But also what you'll see is the certain tricks, maybe that's the wrong word, techniques, that we often adopt in our field to make most effective use of this hardware for performance and then um, what we tend to run on it. And the third theme that we're going to cover through these two days is actually that of serial computing. And as I say, a number of you might have done some programming, might have done some technical work in other fields than these serial fields. But often there's a fundamental difference here. And that is in these other fields, often what's prioritised is programmer time over machine time. In these other fields, programmer time is seen more valuable as machine time and from a programmer's to be able to write quick code, good code, that's often seen as more important than the code running fast. In HPC, in our field here, that's no longer true. Performance is a critical, critical thing. So technologies that you might already be familiar with, such as compilers, such as operating systems, actually we're going to talk about these from a slightly different focus in terms of how we might best use them for performance and how we best use them in our field of HPC, which might be quite different from how you already use these in other areas. Now, in the past two minutes, I've lost count of the number of times I've said the word performance. So I think before I continue, I should really define what I mean by this term. Because actually, it depends entirely on the field you're in. I mean, imagine if you're watching a video, probably the most important performance metric would be frames per second. If you were designing a database, maybe it would be database accesses per second. And for HPC, for our field, we've got specific metrics based upon what our machines do. And if you think back to the three examples I talked about at the start, these are indicative of the applications that we run on a machine like Archer. In terms of, at the end of the day, what it's doing is solving systems of equations, which boils down to doing a whole load of floating point arithmetic. And what I mean by that are examples here. So these fractional numbers being added, multiplied, minus, divided. So in terms of computational performance, what we tend to talk about is the number of floating point operations we can do in a second. And for our machines, or our hardware, such as the processors, what we often talk about is the peak, i.e. the maximum number of floating point operations that that piece of hardware can deliver to us in a second. And modern computers, modern supercomputers, sorry, work in the petaflop range. So that's 10 to the power of 15 floating point operations per second. Now, actually, there's a, a list, a ranking that's published on the internet that's got all the most powerful supercomputers in the world. And currently, the most powerful supercomputer in the world is based in China. That's 125 petaflops, so 125 times 10 to the power of 15 floating point operations per second. And a little bit later on, I'll tell you where our, our resource, Archer, sits in in relation to that. So that's the hardware, that's the pure computational performance. Now, on a daily basis, what we'll see when we're running our own codes, our own parallel codes, it's not just the raw computation that's important, but also other things. I mean, I briefly alluded to the communication earlier and a number of other things as well. So when we're running specific codes on a daily basis, what we often look at is the runtime. And imagine if you've got a code and you do a whole load of new features and it takes twice the amount of time to run, that's probably not so good. If you've got a code and you do lots of improvement, lots of optimization, and it halves the runtime, okay, cool, that's probably quite nice. If you've got a serial code and we parallelize it 
and then it drastically reduces the runtime, potentially that's great, but how do we know if we've got the best improvement possible or if there's still some further improvement we can gain? And a bit later on this morning, we're going to be talking about that in much more detail. So as I say, day-to-day -day runs of code on a machine like Archer, we tend to talk about runtime, and that's what we're going to be dealing with with the different practicals and the different metrics for how well we've done with parallelism. So what we're going to come on to now then is how a machine like Archer is generally laid out and specifically how you might interact with it. Now, the first thing to say is it's not a graphical user environment that we interact with. So it doesn't look anything like Windows, it doesn't look anything like Mac OS. Instead, it's a text-based environment that runs Linux. So I know some of you in here will be familiar with that, some of you not so familiar. And certainly if you're not familiar, don't worry at all, that's one of the reasons we're here, and we expect that, and we can quickly get you going and quickly get familiarity with you on that. Now, these compute nodes I've talked about with my laptop analogy, we don't log into these compute nodes directly. We don't have any direct access to them. Instead, we go into what's called a login node, called the front end, and our jobs are submitted to a queue that's managed by a batch system. And when there's space on the compute nodes, our jobs then run at some point. So based upon when you've queued them up, it might be in the queue for a minute, might be in the queue for 10 minutes, might be in the queue for an hour, might be in the queue for 24 hours. Hopefully, that's quite a long time to wait. But what I'm trying to get across is it's not interactive, it's not absolutely straight away, it's more offline than that. You put jobs in the queue, and then at some point they'll execute, and you'll be able to see the results. You also share the system with many users, and there's thousands of users from the UK community registered on Archer. And what I mean by that, so let's go back to my laptop analogy. So we've got five laptops connected together. And when you're submitting a job to the queue, you'd also tell it the number of compute nodes you need. Because for a specific job with my laptop analogy, I might not need all five laptops, I might only need two laptops. So the batch system is really clever, it will just give me the resource I need, and then the other laptops are available, the other compute nodes are available for somebody else to be given and allocated to. The compute nodes that you are allocated, you have exclusive access to them for the um, entirety of your job run. But as I say, other people could be on other compute nodes using those that you don't need. And also, because the system is shared, we quite tightly monitor and control things like disk space, things like CPU usage, just to make sure everyone's fairly using the system and it's not being abused. So I've got an illustration of this diagrammatically. So this is you on the left. So you SSH your terminal in, the front end, these login nodes. You prepare your job, submit it to the batch system, telling it how many compute nodes you need. So let's say, for instance, you say, I need four compute nodes. So at some point it will run, and let's say these four here are free and given to you. All these others, just completely ignore, and somebody else has got them. That's fine, that's not a problem. But whilst your job is running, whilst you've got these nodes, these four ones, these four compute nodes, you're the only one who has access to them, you've got exclusive access to them. And as I say, you don't have direct access to the compute nodes from the login node. Instead, it goes via a file system. So your job will run, it will write some output that's on the disk, and then you can look at the disk and, um, and have a look at what your program's created. And we're going to go through all of this in the first practical. The only last thing to very briefly mention here, as David said, there's um, a certain allocation of the machine that everybody's got, and we tend to call it a budget. Again, you're going to see it in the first practical. You don't need to worry about it too much for this course because we've got a very, very large budget, more than sufficient for what we need on the course. But it's something you do need to be aware of when you um, go back and use Archer for your own science. Now, your budget starts getting charged as soon as your job runs on the compute nodes, and it stops getting charged when your job stops running. So there's absolutely no charge to your budget for time spent on the login nodes. There's no charge to your budget for time spent in the queue. No charge whatsoever. It's purely the time spent on the compute nodes and the exact charge is based on the number of compute nodes and how long you've got them for. So a common flow is you write some code, maybe on your own machine or maybe on um, the front end of Archer, and then you compile it 
on the front end of Arch on these login nodes. That gets submitted to the queue. At some point, it runs on the number of compute nodes that you request. And then you can analyze the results by looking at the results, these files in the file system. And then often what people will do is either tweak their configuration to do a slightly different run, or maybe, as a software developer, I know this from first hand, realize they've made a mistake, go back, fix a few bugs, maybe add some features that were missing, and do it all again. And again, this is a flow that we're going to look at in more detail practically with the first practical um, very shortly. So what I want to come on to now is really building upon what David said, and that's the specifics, the specifics of Archer, which is the UK national supercomputer. And whilst a lot of the material we're going to cover in these two days, or the entire week, if you're also here for the MPI course, is generic and covers lots and lots and lots of different supercomputers, obviously it's worth thinking about with focusing on Archer, because this is what we've got in the UK, and this is the instrument we're going to be using throughout this course. Now, as I say, it's the UK National Supercomputer. It's funded by EPSERC, funded by NERC. David said, quite rightly, we host and manage it here in Edinburgh in EPCC. The physical location is actually a few miles south of the city. And this is what it looks like. Again, the exact same picture that David showed. And these cabinets, to give you a general idea, they're about that, that high. This is a Cray. It's called a Cray XC30. And the peak computational performance is 2.55 petaflops. So it can do 2.55 times 10 to the power of 15 floating point operations per second. Now, when this was installed at the end of 2013, this was the 19th most powerful machine in the world. We've had it a few years, as I say. So now it's dropped down the rankings, unfortunately. And now it's the 50th in the world. But still, you know, for a small island in the grip of austerity, I don't think that's too bad at all. The fact that this money is made available, there's this emphasis on simulation to get a resource, a machine that is, um, that's that high up in the world rankings. Now, if you were to go along to Archer and open up one of these cabinets, what you would see is a whole load of blades inside, stacked one on top of the other. And they look something like this on the top right. And as I say, the machine is made up of compute nodes. And on each of these blades, we've actually got four nodes. So we've got one node here, one node here, one node here, and one node here. Each node has two Intel processors in it. So for instance, the first node here has processor one, processor two. The second node has processor one, processor two. The third node, processor one, processor two, etc., etc. Each processor has 12 computing cores, so for each node, that's 24 cores overall. The majority of the nodes have 64 gigabytes of memory, but some are what we call high memory, where that's doubled. Now, overall, the machine has about 5,000 nodes, just under 5,000 nodes, so that gives us just under 120,000 computing cores. Now, what this thing is, right at the back of this blade, is what's called the interconnect. And if you think back to my laptop analogy, I told you the net network was really, really important. And so with a machine like Archer, what Cray have done is they've made a very specialist, very advanced networking technology that enables messages, that enables them to communicate as fast as possible. And again, we're going to see why that's important later on. And this is called Aries. So what this is at the bottom right, this diagram, is you've got this Aries connection, this Aries networking chip, with these four different nodes plugged into it, each with two Intel processors, and then that's connected to another blade with a mixture of copper and fiber optics. And again, we're going to cover all these in more detail throughout the course. Very briefly, when you log in to the machine, it's got installed on these login nodes, the front-end nodes that you um, interact with directly, what's called Cray's Application Development Environment, which is a whole load of compilers, a whole load of tools, a whole load of libraries. Again, we're going to talk about all of these in much more detail and how we use them through the course, and you're going to have a play with them for the different practicals. So the last thing I'll say about the machine, purely because it never ceases to amaze me whenever I've gone and seen it, is you look at the machine from the front, and it all looks pretty ordered. 
If you ever look at it from the back, what you have is this huge tangle of wires. And it never ceases to amaze me when you see the systems team plugging things in, plugging things out, and amazingly, the machine doesn't fall over. Obviously, they must know what they're doing. But there's all these different wires, and the reason for showing you this, really, is mentioning that it's this uh, mixture of copper connections here and fibre optics for the communications, along with a whole load of power and other cabling as well. So there's a whole load of stuff that's plugged into this machine. So, in summary, quite often people ask me, what makes a supercomputer? So, why is Archer a supercomputer? And my analogy with a load of laptops connected together, not a supercomputer. And people are often quite surprised when I tell them that a machine like Archer just has fairly standard Intel processors in it and has fairly standard RAM in it. But there's actually two things that make a supercomputer. Firstly, the fact that we've got thousands of processors. And secondly, the fact that we've got this very, very advanced interconnect, this very advanced networking connection that can pass messages very, very quickly. And these two things are absolutely crucial for HPC and parallelism. Because as I say, HPC is synonymous with parallel computing.